Well, good morning and welcome to the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, on behalf of the university and Blackboard, I want to welcome you to the Blackboard Symposium. And also, for those of you from out of town, welcome to Hattiesburg, also known as the Hub City. Um, our university, as of last Thursday, has been teaching classes for 100 years. And we're 112 years old, but it took a couple years to get the buildings built and get people on campus. And last Thursday was the 100th anniversary of our beginning to teach classes at Southern Miss. Uh, for 75 of those years, uh, all of the classes were face-to-face. -face. Um, beginning about 1995, we started using distance delivery technology to broadcast the the classes among then the four uh, teaching sites in the university. And then in 1998, we had our first online learning uh, class, distance learning completely. Um, now we have over 2,000 students that are totally online, um, generate significant tuition revenue for the university, and provides opportunities to reach students not just within the driving area of the university or those that we can reach by distance, uh, but uh, those uh, anywhere they're connected to the internet. And one of the great things about distance learning is you never know when the students are sitting in the back of the room and not at the tables up, up front. So. Um, Southern Miss has had a very long and successful relationship with Blackboard, and we're really pleased to partner with them uh, on this event. And it'll allow you a chance to connect with the Blackboard uh, partners that are here, uh, but more importantly, to connect with your peers from other institutions. Um, and those of you who share um, the belief that collaborative learning and, and interactions are the way to find the best ways to deliver education to our students today. Uh, I'm happy to announce that we've had over 200 people uh, sign up for the, the symposium. Uh, they represent 19 different institutions of higher learning or K through 12 schools. Um, we have 14 sessions that will be available to you over the next two days. Um, we have vendor booths and we have opportunities for you to network with your colleagues from other institutions, which we feel will be a very valuable part of the experience that you have. And the um, our Eagle Online Learning staff and our Learning Enhancement Center has uh, put together the program, and I would like to, to begin by thanking Sherry Rawls and her team for, for doing this, uh, because I think it's organized in a way that you're going to find very effective over the next two days. Thank you, Sherry and your team. <laughs> so I, I encourage you to, uh, to visit the vendor booths, to talk to your colleagues, and, and if you have a chance, wander around and look at our campus. You know, it's not as hot as it usually is here uh, in the summers, and uh, we have a beautiful rose garden. In fact, the university has more rose bushes on this campus than any other university in the country. Um, we have um, the Rock, the stadium, and those of you that are staying over for the weekend will get to, to see at least one great football team play, and maybe two, we hope. <laughs> and... Uh, and of course, the, the uh, Lucas Administration Building, which is a historic building on the front of the campus. So I hope you'll have a chance to, to look around at our campus and, and see the, uh, the opportunities that we have here for our students who are not based in some place around the world and taking online courses. So anyway, thank you for being here. And now I'd like to introduce the, uh, uh, the keynote speaker, Dr. David Davies. Uh, Dr. Davies has served as Dean of the Honors College since 2007. Um, before joining the faculty, he worked for 10 years in the state of Arkansas as a journalist, most recently with the Arkansas Gazette. Um, he came to Southern Miss in 1991. Uh, he started out as the advisor to the Student Prince, our student newspaper, which will be published and out on the aisles today. Uh, he served as then as the chair of the Department of Journalism and as, as well as the interim director of the School of Mass Communications and Journalism and then associate dean in the College of Arts and Letters. Um, he still teaches uh, in the uh, Mass Communication and Journalism program and he's working on his third book, um, which is an analysis of press coverage 
uh, for race, uh, and that's uh, being published by Northwestern University Press. Uh, Dr. Davies will present today a talk entitled Online Instruction, Education's Game Changer. Dave Davies. Thank you, Dr. Wiesenberg. Um, I, uh, but I think uh, the provost decided to relent. Um, I was afraid he would um, step on my opening story, which involves uh, a snail who, across a very, very, very long field, and given the football theme of this conference, I'll say it was two foot field, football fields long, the snail decided to go on that house and knock on the door and see what was going on there. The snail's quite slow and trudges and walks and trudges and walks. Months and months later, he gets to the door, knocks on the door. There's a pause, the door opens, a man comes out, looks around, looks down, sees the snail, is so infuriated at being disturbed, he picks up the snail and flings it across those two football fields and the snail is exactly where it began. The snail, being undeterred, trudges across both football fields. Five, maybe six months later, shows back up at the door, knocks on the door again. The man answers. The snail looks up and says, what was that all about? <laughs> I would argue that that's as apt a metaphor as I can come up with on short notice for what we in the faculty and in universities are considering as we look at online education. Um, I will tell you uh, several times in this presentation that I'm a bit of a dabbler, and I think the, the view that I'm presenting is a faculty view of someone who has um, just dipped his tippy toes into online education. I don't pretend to be any expert, but it seems to me that there is a faculty perspective that, that, that might be worth hearing, but I'll let you be the judge of that. I think that um, it's clear to us that we're, we're dealing with a new technology, uh, the internet, this is, that has changed almost everything around us. Um, in my own background in print media, in broadcast media, in film, and in the recording, ish, in the recording industry, we're looking at the foundations being shaken as a result of the internet. Uh, and it seems to me that it, it's putting an incredible pressure on all of us, on our major institutions as well, uh, including education. We've had the luxury in education of, of holding on um, to our methods because the internet, unlike my old industry of journalism, the internet doesn't undermine our very financial viability. So unlike other institutions facing change from the internet, we haven't had, I would argue, the pressure to change that they indeed are facing. We've had time to adapt, but it seems to me, just as one person looking from the outside, that while we're making some gains, on the whole, I think we're probably adapting a little more slowly than we would like. Uh, Two-thirds of the respondents in my absolutely, positively, completely unscientific poll of conference attendees, Dr. Wiesenberg, my polling methods would not pass muster in RCR training. <laughs> Two-thirds of the respondents say universities are doing less or far less than what they need to do to adapt to the emergence of online education. So I think my view is, is reflective of, of a number of you, but I think of a number of, of faculty members as well. Still, we have to adapt. Um, everyone, of course, sees the world through the lenses of their own research. My area is media history. Um, I got into using technology and education as a way to be able to impart um, some knowledge of this new technology to my students. But I've been interested to see how the technology has um, affected my industry because that's what I do as a media historian. And I think that um, we're in a revolution in terms of communications that is pretty much right up there with the printing press. Um, others all across the country, other universities, um, for-profits, publics, are innovating. 
Um, but all you have to do is look around to see the widely varying pace of change um, to see that um, not everyone is moving at the same rate. I would say that, that faculty need to be leading, uh, that this is something that faculty members, uh, regardless of your background in technology, regardless of whether you're, uh, like me, a, a recovering journalist and have a background in, in, in some flavor of technology, that we need to be doing what we can. But as you know, faculty pretty much vary all across the board. Uh, they vary by the individual, according to their individual inclinations, by their discipline. Uh, some disciplines seeing themselves as more amenable um, to internet instruction than others, and even by the college. Um, I would argue, again, just one person's um, observations, that we're not even in absolute agreement in the academy whether this is an educational revolution or not, and whether we even need to change. And who can blame faculty for this point of view? Um, let's face it. Uh, we've all been teaching a certain way all of our lives, and even folks who are relatively new to the teaching profession are coming, basing their approach on what was taught them in graduate school and before. So even our newest teachers are still in many ways wedded to uh, the old ways that we all grew up with. And furthermore, um, all of us, I think, as individuals and as faculty members, have to be a little flummoxed at the absolute incredible pace of change. Um, I mean, every day there's new programs to consider, uh, new platforms to worry about, new media. Uh, we were talking at breakfast about uh, whatever the new uh, successor to Facebook will be, and all of this is a stressor for us. Moreover, faculty are concerned, I think, and I know all of you are as well, about the mixed reviews that online education gets. We don't have the absolute proof that um, augmenting a course with online delivery actually works in every case, and so there's reasons uh, for faculty to go slow. And lastly, I think faculty, remem faculty members feel unrewarded for trying to use technology. A couple of places in this uh, slide, in this slide in particular, I'm quoting some statistics from uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education. They're a few years old, but they do seem to document um, faculty stress at change, as well as um, their feelings of being unrewarded. So I would argue faculty ought to lead the way. And I think that those of us who dabble should be encouraged. Um, I say games are won by the players, not by the coaches. Sherry, I included a football metaphor. I'm very proud of myself. It was touch and go, but by golly, I did it. Um, later on in the program, I'll, I'll come back to football. But really and truly, faculty are best suited to be able to determine how their content um, can best be adapted to online. Um, it will vary by discipline, it will vary by faculty members' disposition, and the faculty members are best able to say so. And still, faculty survival and institutional health are best determined by how well we meet these demands. Um, I think all of us are looking at it, and we'd agree that we, we're not exactly sure where it's going, but the landscape is going to be incredibly different 20 years from now and we're being pushed to adapt, um, if not at an incredible rate of speed, we're being pushed to adapt by declining state support uh, as well as um, competition by other universities, particularly the for-profits. I also think that students uh, will push us into this change. And those of you who've uh, taught online, many of you I'm sure much, much more than me, would agree that while students are, I would say, hardwired to work with technology, many of them are only partially hardwired. I mean, they get part of it. They know how to use that smartphone, they know how to do this, they know how to do that. Um, I think they will expect us to bring them along. So I would argue very gently today that experimentation with, with support um, from the administration, from uh, our educational leadership, can lead to innovations in the online platform. Um, I think faculty can, um, can work uh, with incentives to try to adapt their courses and their disciplines. I think that faculty benefit from institutional support, both in training, materials, and in hardware, much like what LEC delivers. And, and I have to say that at 
virtually, not at virtually, at every step that, that, that I and my colleagues in mass common journalism have made, every step we've made moving forward and online has been thanks to the LEC. Uh, and I, I would fault the LEC in only one way is that they probably want to offer more programs. I bet Sherry would agree with me. Um, but the support is there. Uh, perhaps we could uh, look at expanding it. And two, I think departments need incentives to push programs online. And this is what my friend Kerry used to call coffee shop talk. Um, in the coffee shops or other places faculty gather, um, there's much talk at least at Southern Miss and probably other places, that there are not the incentives to put classes online. Um, I mean, let's face it, that transition is more work for a faculty member and for a department, and indeed, um, delivering the course for the longer term uh, may or may not be more work for the faculty member and the department, and some sort of incentive, I think, could uh, pay off in terms of increased offerings. I wanted to talk a little bit about my own humble experience. Uh, can you see that's my word of the day, humble? Um, I want to talk about just a few things that I did, and I'm trying to steal some of your ideas, thanks to that uh, survey that I, that I published a few days back, the scientific one. And so we'll come back to some of your ideas as well. I don't profess to be an expert in, in how best to deliver um, online or hybrid courses. The courses that I've offered are nearly always mostly face-to-face -face with some uh, electronic delivery of some elements to try to take advantage of student interest um, in technology. I think, though, that, that technology is a way, particularly in less than riveting subjects, technology may be a way to engage students. Right now, I'm teaching a um, an introduction to research course in the Honors College. It's just a little one hour introduction to research. And I'm trying to use technology as much as I can to deliver messages in alternate ways just to get the students involved. I think video is of particular interest to students. Now, I don't know how long this is gonna last. I mean, is video so compelling as a medium that 20, 30, 40 years from now, students are still gonna be glued to it? I don't know. There may be something that um, that supersedes it. Maybe those Google Glasses will do everything they promise and more. But for now, students seem to be really caught up in video and I think that we can use it to our ad advantage. I think that students appreciate some level of technological savvy uh, in faculty members. And um, they appreciate the effort that we make to deliver coursework using some technological innovations, assuming that the material is delivered effectively. Um, I mean, the online world is, is riddled with examples where uh, technology does not necessarily enhance delivery of or understanding of the material. But teachers, excuse me, students indeed appreciate it as long uh, as they feel like they're getting the, the material effectively. And I think, and this is, I'll give you some examples of this in just a minute, that student-driven projects really engage students. Uh, so when, when I talk to, to my colleagues about the kinds of uh, innovations we might try in the classroom, I think getting the students to engage with the technology, to communicate among themselves and with you uh, an understanding of the material is one way to engage them and uh, to move us a little closer to online. So in my little world, remember humble, in my humble little world, uh, I've used some small student projects in which they have to use new technology to, to put together information showing their knowledge of, um, of the um, material. Um, many of my projects I can directly thank LEC for in terms of getting the training to carry these out. Uh, four years ago I could barely spell podcast, uh, but I was involved with an LEC project on podcasting that um, coupled with my own um, humble knowledge of web design uh, allowed uh, Dr. Fei Shua uh, and me to introduce some elements of podcasting, web design, and video casting uh, into our own coursework in the School of Mass Communication and Journalism. Uh, student aut autobiographies are an easy way to get students involved. Uh, students, like each one of us, love to talk about themselves. Um, they can use this new technology that is sitting in their pocket to do a video of themselves to talk about um, uh, where they want to go and what they want to do 
it's a benefit to you to help you get to know them. And we'll talk about, I have an example for that in just a second. Obviously, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. The educational landscape is full of all kinds of materials that you can offer students, speeches, talks, presentations, whatnot, um, that are available on the internet that otherwise we would have not had access to. I use video for announcements. Uh, some of my students had um, a little trouble this week operating something on Blackboard. So I made a two minute video on my uh, little flip camera and uploaded it immediately. Uh, I upload two places. Uh, I upload to, to Blackboard, uh, obviously, but I also upload to Facebook. Uh, Facebook is just a supplement. It gives them one more place to check, um, but they're not required to be on it. In fact, a few of the kids aren't even on Facebook. Um, but I figure if there's one more way I could get them, then by golly, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and get them. I have a couple of examples here. Um, I'm only going to show you the top one. Um, last year, um, some of our classes tried especially hard to integrate new technology into their classroom. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wendy Atkins Sayer took her students to Birmingham as part of a Communication Studies 111 course, and students were required to do a video of their experience there. Uh, and I, as I think you'll see from the video, uh, it combines a bit of fun with also some understanding of the historic place that they're visiting. But I would argue that, that the students who did this, Daniel Paul and uh, Blake Houston, um, the experience probably resonated with them a little more because of the additional work that they had to do in uh, putting together this video. Let's take a look. Sorry. Just told it be New York, you know, you make my heart skip. In my dreams, I make it in the way. It's been one hell of a ride. Yeah. It's me every time. I can't get Chicago off my mind. New Jersey taught me how to let go. And I've learned it's all that I need to know. Civil rights movement has been a big part of our whole semester, and it's just something that I really took a lot for granted before this class. But ever since the class started, we started doing speeches about it, and started coming on trips to learn about the civil rights movement. I've really had my eyes open to a lot of things that happened just decades ago, that there have been so many changes over the past years that I just didn't know Coming to this place in Birmingham, standing in front of Kelly Ingram Park, just really overloads my mind with events about the Civil Rights Movement. Looking over at 16th Street Baptist Church where the bombings happened, over at the Civil Rights Institute, you know, my eyes were really open to a lot of things that I'd never even contemplated before. Um, just talking about the hardships that you the oppressions that they face, but still overcoming all of these things. Movement. I'm excited to see what happens now. Oh, greetings! From Birmingham! One, two, one, two, two. Our trip's basically concluded, and we stand here for the last time in uh, Kelly Ingram Park, which uh, really commemorates several key figures and events of the movement. Uh, being right here and looking across the street at 16th Street Baptist Church and then seeing the Civil Rights Institute really is just a testament as to how much things have changed. Now, I look around at these images and can't help but think, you know, how much courage, how much 
you know, hard work went into this change. You look around, and this place seems to be so peaceful. It sharply contrasts with, you know, the images of the dogs, the images of the children behind the bars, the images of the fire hoses that, you know, could, could knock bricks loose from 100 feet. And it's, it's frightening. Um, the fact that that was so, such a recent event is really what strikes me. And, uh, you know, I know there's still work to be done, but for the most part, I'm really proud not only of this country, but of the world. We're really changing things. And I hope that my generation will do their part to uphold that. And to be honest, I think that this beach trip has been a testament that we really will. So I've learned a lot, and I hope to continue learning things throughout not just this next semester, but for my life. And I would... Um, in case you were wondering, uh, Daniel Paul indeed is um, uh, Joe Paul's son. And uh, I got permission from both of those students as well as Dr. Uh, Atkin Sayer to use that video. But if you see Joe Paul today, tell him you saw Daniel Paul's video. It'll just, uh, it'll just freak him out. <laughs> oh, Joe Paul's our Vice President for Student Affairs. <laughs> Joe Paul is so well known on this campus. Every student knows him. And when I was uh, advisor to the student prince, I finally prohibited my, my reporters from talking to him. Because if there was a sewer problem, they'd talk to Joe Paul. If there was a campus uh, police problem, they'd talk to Joe Paul, because he was always so readily available. So, Joe Paul. Um, one reflection on that. I think that Daniel's closing line there really isn't that much different from a self-reflective essay you would ask a student to write after, after such a visit. But I would argue that probably the students were um, a little more engaged than they might have been uh, otherwise. Um, I'm only going to show you a couple of these, and these are, are a lot shorter than what you've seen so far. For my Honors 300 class a, uh, a year ago, I had my students do autobiographical videos. And uh, some of the students had a lot of fun. Uh, I'm not going to show you the one where the student came into my office when I wasn't there, sat behind my desk, put his feet up, and did the video there. Uh, <laughs> but I I'll show you... A, yeah, I'll show, I'll show you a couple of others. I just love these, and the students got really creative. Um, Sarah Beth White, I swear I will go to my grave uh, remembering, remembering Sarah Beth in this video. <laughs> there are people in my building who will say, will you quit showing me that video? <laughs> I have shown it over and over and over. I think it captured her personality, and from my standpoint, no, I mean, it didn't really drive home the course content of Honors 300, Introduction to Research, but it, in, in a class of 100 to 120 students, there's one more student whose face I recognize, and with, 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 with luck, um, that little relationship might lead to her um, trying just a little bit harder and the class material resonating with her. Uh, just a little bit more. I have one other to show you. Um, this is Kevin Buckley, another one of the uh, pretty interesting ones. Hey, hey Dean Davies, it's Kevin Buckley here. Um, I'm in a car right now. My seatbelt's on. Can't tell, it's dark outside. That's why I use my phone as a flashlight. But anyways, I'm a junior psychology, no, junior marketing major with a minor in psychology from Columbia, Mississippi, 30 minutes west of Hattiesburg. And fun fact, at the moment is that I think I'm a decent friend right now. Oh, I'm also with uh, Carson Showmaker. Hey, Dean Davies. 
He's driving. I'm not. Or am I? <laughs> <laughs> um, fun fact is, uh, I really like coffee shops, and one day I hope to own one in about 10, 20 years, own my own coffee shop while I'm uh, teaching on the side as a marketing professor. And that's it. Uh, this summer, I'll just tell you about this, I don't have any presentations, I for the first time used Twitter in my British Studies class. Um, and I was so excited about it, I was disappointed when I couldn't think of a use for Twitter in my current Honors 300 class. But what we did was, um, uh, in previous years, students had to compile their notes for me from British Studies. So if we go to the BBC, they would have to take a page full of notes, and at the end of the semester, they turned in all of their notes, and I had a sense of whether they, were, whether they had uh, been paying attention, uh, been diligent, and all the rest. The problem was that, with that was that it, um, it really didn't give me a window into whether they were getting it as we went along. Um, so I decided I would try something new. So I had students tweet after every visit. So if we went to the BBC, they would tweet five or six takeaway concepts that they learned from that visit to the BBC. They would tweet under the hashtag BSPJ, British Studies Program Journalism, and um, we would um, have that hashtag to be able to see what everyone in the class was writing at that time. So literally, I could go back to the dorm. Uh, once the students had tweeted, I could, with just a few clicks, see what kind of attention I was getting at the visits, what kind of attention I was getting to the concepts, I wanted to take them away, and then could immediately turn around and talk to them um, about that. It also had a benefit that I hadn't expected, and that was engagement with each other, because they would talk back and forth to each other. And then more importantly, they engaged with the people we were actually visiting. Because if we visited a journalist at the Telegraph, for example, they would mention the Telegraph editor reporter in the tweet, and many of their tweets got picked up and retweeted by the news organizations that we were actually visiting. Um, and it just thrilled them to their socks. Hey, I got retweeted by the Press Complaints Commission. And I think it sort of pulled them into the material in a way that um, was really interesting and, and really turned out to reinforce the, the content. Um, I have a little bit more time left. Um, I know that Sherry's something of a time dictator, so I'm going to, I'm going to move along. I'm, I'm, I'm more than a little scared of her. Um, I want to, for the rest of this, to take advantage of uh, some of your comments in that online survey. Because as I've made clear, I see um, the entire purpose of my keynote to say that I, I think uh, faculty should probably engage more and lead the charge. And my sense was that, that you probably had uh, uh, as many as or better examples than I have. So I ask for some of you all to to give me some of what you saw as best practices in your, um, in your universities. This person writes, I was able to successfully combine Wimba classes for a single VIP guest lecture. I gave the other professor section of students my course's Wimba guest link. Then we all combined, had two separate sections of the same class listening to a single VIP guest lecture. The class was archived. Uh, students were able to see it later. Uh, I've done similar things with guest speakers. Um, sometimes I have um, uh, guest speakers come to class via Skype, which is pretty compelling. Students kind of like it. They can see uh, almost anybody under the sun uh, with a phone line, uh, and it really turns out to work really well. A few more examples. An English professor videotaped herself giving lectures as if the students were present in the classroom. Now, I think that's pretty crazy. That's pretty cool. And my students already think I'm half crazy anyway. So if I started addressing them as if they were in the room, I think that would send them over the top. But they might watch the whole thing just to, uh, get, uh, uh, to see what would happen. But in the process, they'd get um, a good uh, dose of the lecture as well. Uh, this is something that I intend to try uh, this semester, 10 to 15 minute videos explaining a subject more in depth. This is something that the students can go back to over and over again. In my own research class, uh, I hope to get professors talking about one aspect of their research in detail. Um, if it's a business prop, the business students are all going to go for it. 
If they're not business students, the others will go for it because it's only going to be 5, 10, or 15 minutes. And I think it's a way to slip in more content uh, to your courses without the students realizing that they've been bamboozled. <laughs> uh, I've tried a version of this this semester. I have students post pictures of themselves as part of their introductions to other classmates. The students are asked to post pictures of themselves with their favorite things or engaging in favorite activities or hobbies. This semester I had all of my students send me a picture and then I have it on a, on a closed website that only I can see and I have a, I have a little folder with all of their pictures. Um, I've been frustrated in these large classes that you don't have a handle on exactly who is who and this has helped. I love this idea of getting personal anecdotes um, from the, um, or having some sort of personalized pictures so you have even one more thing to remember the students by. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up because we need to move on if I'm, if I'm correct. So I'm not going, you are spared the last part of my presentation, so consider yourself lucky. Um, I would close just by uh, reiterating a couple of points. Um, I don't believe that I have the absolute best grasp of what's happening nationally. But I think that in, in my own little world, I think that it's clear that probably we as faculty uh, could do more to lead the way, discipline by discipline, as we um, tackle this, this emerging um, opportunity of online delivery. I think that whether I in journalism or my friends in history or my friends in foreign language think that the discipline can be adapted or not, I think that's irrelevant. I think that if we don't lead the way, adapting as best we can to deliver our content, someone else will, and they may or may not do it as well as we would like. It may well be that History 101 and 102 cannot be successfully translated to online delivery or speech comm or political science, name any course you would like. I don't know whether every course can, but I challenge faculty to pick up the, the, uh, the role of determining whether indeed we can do it. Because if we don't do it, someone else will. We don't know what's going to happen in the next 20 years, but I think we would all agree that the educational landscape is shifting absolutely dramatically. I'll close by saying this is just one humble faculty member's opinion. Uh, as uh, my friend Patrick Washburn at Ohio University likes to say in these contexts, I may or may not have uh, shed much new light on this particular subject, but as Pat says, sometimes even a blind hog finds an acorn. Yeah.